Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. It's good to see all of you out there. Um, for those who are visiting today, uh, thank you so much for your presence. We're honored for you to be here. Uh, if you're willing, there is a information card in the seat back pocket in front of you. Uh, if you want to fill up something out, just so we know your presence, we will not contact you unless you request that. Um, so please do that. Uh, if you'll turn to page 15, 16 in your bulletin, just hit a couple of quick announcements. Um, first announcements are our senior pastor, uh, Darren Harper, is away on a well-earned sabbatical. Uh, we've been trying to get him out of here for a couple of years and finally got him out of here. Uh, so I talked to him last night. He's uh, somewhere en route to, where was he going? Somewhere in the Carolinas, Tennessee area. Um, looking forward to spending time with his parents this week in Birmingham. Uh, so just pray for him. Uh, this is a real opportunity for him to rest, uh, to reflect. Uh, if you guys don't know, this year, see, I don't know, it's either 20 or 20. I think this year is 25 years for Darren here at Emmanuel. Um, and he has been an amazingly faithful uh, pastor and friend and brother uh, to so many of us. Uh, and so he, yeah, it's well earned. So just please pray for rest, reflection. Um, there is no desire that the session knows of him to, to change anything. He just needs a time away. So pray for that for him. Uh, and then, amazingly, Tyler is gone this week too, so our new associate pastor. Uh, he is uh, with family in, they're in Minnesota this week with Kristen's family. Uh, so pray that they would have a good restful time. And then next week you'll be back to the, you know, at least one professional might be here next week. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. John Tweedale here. Uh, for those who were at Tyler's ordination service, uh, John spoke then and was very encouraging. And so we look forward to him sharing the word uh, with us today. Uh, elder on call, while Darren and, and ironically I'll be gone this week, I'm going back up to Dalton to, uh, to do some more uh, Rebuilding Hope missions work. And so Stuart, Stuart, is your elder on call? Uh, please don't call Darren. Um, hopefully he wouldn't answer. Uh, but if you have any needs during the week, please call Stuart. His number is in the back of the bulletin. Uh, what else? Uh, we will be having a VBS here uh, run by Grace Life Church of Daltona from Friday, July 25th through July 28th. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in being a part of that or, just, or sending kids or grandkids to it, um, there's contact information here. Uh, our reflection quote, I mean, I'm sorry, our scripture memory this week uh, is Judges 21-25. This is a really easy one to remember uh, because it's very timely. Uh, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Doesn't sound any different than today, does it? Yeah, so pretty easy to remember. Uh, our Westminster Shorter Catechism questions for the month, I believe. Uh, which is the third commandment? Third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And what is required in that commandment requireth the holy and reverent use of God's names, titles, attributes, ordinances, word, and works. So that, let me pray for us, and then we will stand for our call to worship. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are beyond good, beyond holy. You are the one. Father, as we just looked at uh, in Sunday school, your creation is amazing uh, and yet reflects only a portion of who you are, a small portion. Father, we, we praise you that it is through your son, uh, through his sacrificial death for us, for rebels like us, enemies of God. Lord, that is where your true character shines. And so, Father, we just praise you that you are the one, the one who has chosen uh, to make a world and to rescue a world through your Son. Pray, Lord, as we worship today, that you would remind us of our brokenness, uh, remind us of your goodness and faithfulness to us, and Lord, remind us of the great hope that we have in Jesus Christ, both today and forever. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as you're able, if you'll please stand for a call to worship. Uh, I will read the light print if you will respond with the bold print. From Psalm 103, verse 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord.
who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Today's affirmation of faith is for us to reflect upon the significance of the seventh commandment on adultery. I'd like to make just a couple of comments upon my reflections in preparation from, for looking at this section of the Heidelberg Catechism. Just as each of the persons of the Trinity seeks to honor and glorify the other, so should we focus on keeping this command to honor the Holy Spirit which is with us. Also, this reminder in regards to this command, Christ taught us that we can violate it with our thoughts. Uh, so we must guard our thought life. He said when we look on someone with lustful intent, we have broken this commandment. Thus we must live our lives in a way to fight against lust, both to properly love our spouse, our neighbor, our God, and so that our marriages may flourish with bountiful joy in the oneness that God designed. So now, may we, with these questions and answers, may they be used to help us see the gravity, the breadth, and the love of God's guidance. I'll read the question, if you will please respond in unison with what is in bold. What does the seventh commandment teach us? That 
Does God in this commandment forbid nothing more than adultery and similar shameful sins? Now, please join me as we confess our sins before our Heavenly Father, and after we confess in unison with the words in the bulletin, there will be a time for silent confession. Join me. Father, we confess today that we have broken your commandment that forbids adultery. You command us to love our neighbors, family members, and fellow Christians with our thoughts, hearts, and actions, but we have not. Instead, we have believed the lie that others are made for our own fleeting pleasures, and, and we have treated them that way. Forgive us, we pray, for our failure to love in the pure and beautiful way that you command and model for us. Cleanse and strengthen all our relationships with the redeeming blood of Jesus, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Father, thank you for delighting in hearing our confession. Amen. Now hear the words of our assurance of pardon, which is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we now sing the goodness of Jesus.
please be seated. Now let's go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. May it come what may that we would rest all our days in the goodness of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would apply the truths of these words to our hearts now, that Jesus is perfect love and is available to comfort our tears, that we can rest in his wondrous peace, that our joy is complete as he is the source of living water from which we will never thirst again, and that our hope is found in Christ, and that grace overflows continually from his heart. Now, we bring before you, Heavenly Father, a family here at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. We bring before you Scott and Hannah Carraro, and their boys, Titus, Judah, and Levi. As we have been reminded this day of our need to fight for purity of each of our marriages. We pray now for Scott and Hannah's marriage. We pray that you would guard, strengthen, and bless their marriage. And may it be an example to their extended family of your goodness to those who seek to walk with you. During this summer season, we pray that you would bless each of their boys, Titus, Judah, and Levi, as they are spending more time together and their emotions are intense. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will grant to all patience one with another and help Scott and Hannah in the shepherding of their hearts. May these boys learn not to just respond out of natural anger or instinct, but to seek the best for their brother. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be in the details this fall of the boys' education. For Titus, we pray, Heavenly Father, as he will be transitioning to a hybrid education model, where on certain days of the week, Hannah will not just be his mom, but she will also be his teacher. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless their time together. We pray that you would be in Hannah and Scott's ongoing mourning process for Noah as the weightiness of this loss ebbs and flows based on memory triggers. May Christ, who knows what it means, to mourn losing a loved one, bring comfort, strength, and peace into Hannah and Scott's lives. Hannah and Scott have expressed their gratitude to this body for their ongoing extension of love as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to help us to fill one another up with Christ's love, strengthening your bride as a whole. Heavenly Father, you are always at work pursuing your people with your loving kindness. At times, from our vantage point, your plans appear to be in shadows, making it difficult for us to see your goodness as we go through difficult providences. But we know there are no rogue molecules and all is under your control. Your word teaches us that you knit us together in our mother's womb. So Heavenly Father, we delight in the joy that you have brought into the lives of Ryan and Ellie Frazier through the birth of their daughter, Olivia. To date, she has faced many challenges. 
We are grateful for those in the medical community that you have gifted with skills to address her physical needs. Olivia is scheduled for one more surgery this Friday, July 14th, and we pray for her medical team, for the skills and insights into what is best for her doing, during her surgery. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will watch over and protect Olivia before, during, and after her surgery. Give her all that she needs to recover quickly. And we pray your perfect peace into the lives of her parents, Ryan and Ellie, and her grandparents. May this experience enable them to bless others with your gospel. Now we pray for Christ's bride, your church, and for our sister church in our presbytery, St. Andrew's Chapel of Sanford, Florida. We give you great praise for the ministry of their church and their faithful proclamation of the gospel for over 25 years. We rejoice in their joining the Presbyterian Church in America on June 25th after much hard work by our presbytery, uh, St. Andrew's pastors, and their 12 elders and 25 deacons. Thank you for the recent visit of Ray Vesnacio, one of their elders, as he met with our session recently. And as iron sharpens iron, may the leadership of St. Andrew's Chapel and that of the Central Florida Presbytery continue to learn from one another, grow in grace, and work together for your great glory. We pray, Heavenly Father, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would guide their pastors, Burke Parsons, uh, Don Bailey, Kevin Strzok, Stephen Adams, and that you would guide them in your word so that they are equipped to minister your word and encourage and strengthen their congregation as needed. Now we pray for the gospel ministry to our neighbors. We pray a blessing upon the ministries of the Florida Church Planting Network, which exists to support the presbyteries and churches as they plant reproducing churches throughout the state of Florida. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would honor their desire to see a gospel-centered church planted and flourishing in each of Florida's communities. Now specifically, we pray for three of the youngest churches that are part of this network. We pray for University Presbyterian Church of Tampa, which is in the Temple Terrace area near the University of South Florida. And we pray for their pastor, Wright Bushing, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless their Sunday afternoon studies. We are grateful for their relationship and partnership with the RUF pastor, Aldo Mondin, at the University of South Florida. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to bless their partnership and their work with Aldo and the students of UCF. We pray, Heavenly Father, for fruitful evangelism amongst this congregation. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would assist them in connecting with people who are desirous of being part of their core group. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be in all the details, all the plans for their launch of their first worship service, official worship service, on September 10th. 10th of this year. Now we bring before you Kissimmee Fellowship and their pastor Heath Zuniga. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for their vision for an English and Spanish church in this area to reach many of the Spanish-speaking members of their community. 
be with their Sunday evening fellowship gatherings. Strengthen the relationships one to another and with Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would provide an affordable space for them to use for their Sunday worship and their desire to also use it for a midweek um, gathering. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with their ministry team formation and its growth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for the heart of prayer for these people. May it bear fruit in evangelism to the lost and mercy to those in the least. And may their goal be realized of reaching weekly worship services in September also of this year. Last but not least, Heavenly Father, we pray for Christ Church Sarasota and Pastor Chris Knoble. Be in their early morning downtown worship services. Increase their, the number of their launch team and create within them a united vision. May your spirit be at work in the life of this body to draw hearts to Christ. And may you receive all the glory and honor that is due your name. In Christ Jesus, amen. Please stand as we now sing Ferris Lord Jesus. pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you for you're the provider of all things. Lord, you, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth and its fullness are all yours. And yet, Father, you deem to provide for us, each of us, daily, weekly. So, Father, we pray that uh, as you have provided for us, that you would spur on our hearts. You would give us one more thing, which is cheerful desire to give to others. And Lord, we pray that uh, as we give, that you would use these tithes and offerings uh, for the betterment, the in improvement, the increase of your church and your world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
please stand for the doxology. Open your copy of God's Word to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And as you're turning in your Bibles, let me just say how grateful to God I am for you and for the joy of worshiping with you today. I praise God especially for the ministry of Pastor Darren and Pastor Tyler, uh, these are faithful shepherds, and they're also dear friends. And God has given you two wonderful gifts in these remarkable servants in Christ's church. And so I am especially grateful that you have given Pastor Darren a much-needed uh, sabbatical. And I join you and pray that it would be a time of rest and refreshment so that he could, as a under-shepherd, be even more faithful in bringing you as Christ's sheep to green pastures and still waters. It's important that you care for your pastors. And so I'm also thankful to God that you've given uh, the Kennys uh, even a vacation uh, to go to Minnesota. I have just returned uh, from Minnesota. My wife uh, grew up in the northern part of the state. And let me just say, the summer is the time you want to send the Kinneys to Minnesota. <laughs> but anyway, I am grateful to God for the witness of this congregation in Deland. I am grateful for this opportunity to serve with you and to join you in the worship and praise of our triune God together. So before we read God's word and hear it proclaimed, let's go to him in prayer. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonder of your word. We praise you that your Holy Spirit so long ago inspired holy men that they would record for us your sacred word. And so we pray that the Spirit who inspired these words would illumine our minds and our hearts that we might hear your word and apply your word and live by your word. Lord, we know that your word is life. So sanctify us by the truth of your word. We pray this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Hear now the word of God from Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus called to him his twelve disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, 
Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Amen. And this ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he add his blessing to us here this morning. One of the central features of the Gospel of Matthew is its central focus on the teaching ministry of Jesus. From the very start of his public ministry, after his temptation in Matthew chapter 4, to the very end of his ministry at the ascension in Matthew 28, Jesus is teaching. Jesus came into the world heralding the glorious good news of the coming of the kingdom. We're given a summary of Jesus' teaching ministry at the end of Matthew chapter 9. Actually, from Matthew 4 to Matthew 9, you have a summary of Jesus' Galilean ministry. At the end of Matthew 4, you see a summary of Jesus' ministry. Then you have the Sermon on the Mount. And then at the end of Matthew 9, you have another summary of Jesus' ministry. So in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, we have this summary statement. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, and what was he doing? Teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Jesus came into the world teaching. Now, the primary way that Jesus conducted his ministry then was through the proclamation of the gospel. And this theme runs like a scarlet thread all throughout the entirety of Matthew's gospel. In fact, the gospel itself is actually structured according to five main discourses from the lips of Jesus. Now, I'm not a huge, huge fan of red-letter Bibles. They're not the end of the world, but we know that all the Bible is the Word of God, not just the red-letter parts. But if you have a red-letter Bible, it can sometimes help you, and if you scroll through the, the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see five big chunks of red. And those red chunks there represent the five main discourses of Jesus throughout Matthew's gospel. The first big chunk, of course, is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The second main discourse of Jesus is right here in Matthew chapter 10. It's an extended sermon from Jesus on the topic of what it means to be his disciple. Isn't that amazing? We actually have summaries of Jesus' sermons right here in in the Gospel of Matthew. Then if you look at the other three discourses, just to, to note them, and you can go back and study them for yourselves, you'll see in chapter 13 the parables of Jesus, and then in chapter 18, where Jesus teaches on the establishment of the church. And then very famously in Matthew 24, Jesus teaches on the end times. So there you have it, five big sections representing summaries of the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ. Well, this morning I want to focus on the beginning of Jesus' discourse here in Matthew 10. And in this chapter... Jesus outlines several characteristics of what it means to be his disciple. Don't you want to be a follower of Jesus? Don't you want to be his disciple? Well, if you do, don't you want to know what he expects from you as his disciple? 
Well, one place you can look is here in Matthew chapter 10. And here we learn that to be a follower of Jesus means that we have been called by Christ to share life with Him. Isn't that remarkable? That Jesus calls you by name. And you, He calls you to be His disciple. And he calls you to share life and ministry with Him. That's what it means to be His disciple, to share life with Jesus. And so in our passage here in Matthew 10, Jesus calls a ragtag group of 12 men to join Him in gospel ministry. These 12 are a rough lot, much like me and you. There's nothing too spectacular about us, is there? We're a rather ragtag team of disciples, of men and women who have been called out from a life of sin and misery into a life of service in Christ's kingdom. Glory be to God. Now, while the apostles serve a unique role within the history of redemption, in many ways their calling here in Matthew 10, serves as a paradigm, a model of Christ's call to us to be His followers and carry out His work today. Right? So we understand the apostles are unique, and we can't completely relate to everything they experienced. We don't know what it was like to have our eyeballs fall upon the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, friends, one day faith will become sight if you trust in Jesus here today. But there are some analogies. There are lessons that we can learn from the ministry of the apostles as we seek to be faithful disciples for Jesus today. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. So this morning today, I want to consider with you this passage under three headings. You will find... You will find the outline in your bulletin, and I just want to, to know something here, okay? Uh, the title says, Follow Me, and then it has my name under it. Follow me, Dr. John Tweedale, okay? That's, that's not the goal of the sermon, okay? <laughs> follow me means follow Jesus. Now, if anything we can say with Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, but that was not intentional, at least on, on my part. I am not trying to make... Uh, disciples of Tweedale, I am trying to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the first place here today, I want to consider with you the calling of Christ's disciples. In verse 1, Jesus calls a group of 12 unlikely fellows to follow Him. Jesus, it says, called to Him His 12 disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Notice here the emphasis isn't on the twelve, it's on Jesus. He is our north star. The emphasis is on Jesus. Matthew has already introduced at least five of the disciples in the gospel so far. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22, right before the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls to himself Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And he calls these four individuals in Matthew 4 to leave their careers as fishermen in order to become his disciples. And it's in this context we get those beautiful and famous words where Jesus says to His disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We're told then immediately after that call, they follow Jesus, they leave their nets, they take up their cross and they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 9, in chapter 9 verse 9, Jesus controversially calls another disciple. He 
He calls Matthew the tax collector to be his follower. Now, the fact that Jesus would associate himself with someone from such an ignoble vocation as tax collecting was scandalous to the religious leaders. The Pharisees wanted big shots, wanted notoriety, and they were scandalized that Jesus would associate himself with someone as ignoble, as dishonorable as a tax collector, with apologies to anyone here today who's in finance. But Jesus took the occasion, right, when he called Matthew to announce in Matthew chapter 9, verse 19, that he came not to call the righteous but sinners to himself. That's good news for you today. Jesus Jesus is not looking for those who are put together, who are well known, who have notoriety and significance. No, he's looking for those who know their need of him. He's looking for sinners like you and me who will put their faith in him and him alone. So when Jesus began his public ministry, he had four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And then with Matthew, the tax collector, he had five. But now here in chapter 10, we are told there are 12, from four to five, and now 12. Notice these men are known first and foremost by their relationship to Jesus Christ. They are His disciples. That is how they are known. That's what sets them apart from everyone else. They belong to Jesus. But why 12? Why not 10? Why not 15? Why not everyone on the planet? Why not billions? Why 12? We know that Jesus ministered to many, many individuals throughout his public ministry. We also know that he commissioned more than 12. He commissioned 70 of his disciples to go two by two. He also frequently preached to large gatherings as he did at the Sermon on the Mount. So we know that Jesus did not limit his ministry to the twelve. There is something significant, however, about them and about this school of discipleship. So what is the significance of having twelve? Well, evidently this number was important enough to the disciples themselves that when Judas betrayed Jesus they cast lots to bring the number from 11 back up to 12 in Acts chapter 1. So it's clearly a big deal. I'm not just reading into this or spiritualizing the text. The number 12 actually has some significance in the narrative. It was a big deal for the disciples. Indeed, it was a big deal for Jesus. Jesus actually says in Matthew 19, verse 28... The calling of the twelve corresponds in some ways to the twelve disciples of the twelve tribes of Israel. As there were twelve tribes in Israel, so too there are twelve disciples. So in Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In other words, according to Jesus, the twelve disciples represent the formation of a people whose identity is not fixed on a nation, but on a person. The calling of the twelve represents the formation of a people whose identity is not fixed to a nation, but to a person, namely Jesus. It's not about being from Israel. It's not about being a Hebrew. It's not about your DNA. It's about your identity, your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about flesh. It's about faith. It's about, not about national heritage, it's about your commitment to Jesus Christ. The calling of the twelve represents the formation of a new people, 
a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation whose chief identity is found in Jesus Christ alone. The great Dutch commentator William Hendrickson states that the disciples form the nucleus of a new Israel, of the people of God, a global reality. Calvin even suggests the number 12 was intended to point out the future restoration of the church, a church comprising of people from all various backgrounds and ethnicities who identify with each other based on their relationship to Jesus Christ. You see, up until this point in redemptive history, Israel was God's nation, His treasured possession, His royal priesthood, His covenant people, as we learn in Exodus 19. But sadly, however, many in Israel presumed upon God's grace. They stood on their heritage as the physical descendants of Abraham, and they did not follow their father's faith. For them, it was more important to be of the flesh of Israel than to hold on to the faith of Abraham. And it was a fundamental mistake for Israel. They presumed upon God's grace. Well, we're from Israel. We're God's chosen possession. And they failed to cling to the Messiah when he stood in front of them. Oh, David himself says, Lord, keep me back from presumptuous sin. Friends, we can't ride on the coattails of our parents' faith. This is especially true for those of you who are younger here today. All right, your faith must be your own. You can't say, well, I, came, I come from a great family. I've been a member in my church all my life. I come from a great country. No, what matters ultimately, friends, is not your status. It's your relationship to Jesus Christ. So with the calling of the twelve, we see the embodiment of the people of God. A group of disciples who are defined by their relationship to Jesus. And so what is a disciple? What is a disciple? A disciple is one who follows Jesus. Uh, A disciple is a student. A student enrolled in the school of Christ. He is your chief teacher in life, not your parent, not your pastor, not your elder, not your deacon, not your grandparents, not your employer, not your boss, but Christ is your chief teacher, your chief educator, your chief pastor. And to be a disciple means being a student who follows Jesus for the purpose of learning from him. We are His disciples. The greatest calling you have on your life is not a calling to be a dad or a mom or a son or a daughter, as great as those things are. The most fundamental calling you have on your life is to be a Christian. I love being a Presbyterian. I I love being a minister in the Presbyterian church. My friends, I don't think of myself primarily as a Presbyterian. I think of myself as a Christian. I happen to be a Christian in a very Presbyterian sort of way. But my calling is to be a Christian, is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my North Star. He's the one I identify with more than anyone else. It's what it means to be his disciple. Isn't it wonderful that when Jesus came into the world, Mark 3.14 says he had disciples with him. Jesus wanted to have disciples with him, to enjoy life with him, ministry with him. Jesus doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But Jesus delights to bring his people into fellowship with him. My wife and three kids are enjoying, actually, camping this weekend in northern Wisconsin. They're still on vacation with my wife's parents. They aren't with me. I I miss 
my wife when she isn't with me. Right? We could do anything together as long as I'm with my wife. Right? That's what it means to be a Christian. You can do anything, you can be anywhere as long as you are with Jesus. And so for a three-year period, Jesus trained these disciples, taught these disciples, and ministered with these disciples alongside of these disciples. Jesus invested his life in these 12 men that they might serve him in ministry. So we learn from this passage that a disciple is someone who is called by Jesus, whose identity is defined by their relationship with Jesus. A disciple is someone who follows him no matter what. So discipleship, friends, means a life lived with Jesus Christ in every other calling. Every calling I have in my life is first defined by my relationship with Jesus. I happen to be a son. I happen to be a brother. I happen to be a, a husband. I happen to be a father. I, I happen to be a minister of the gospel. I happen to be a professor. I happen to be a, a vice president. But in all of those things, fundamentally, I am a Christian. And I'm called to bring Jesus with me in all those other callings so that I might glorify him in what he calls me to do today. So you have the calling of Christ's disciples. Secondly, here you have the ministry of Christ's disciples. And this is truly extraordinary. Here in chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Here in verse 1, we learn that Christ calls his disciples to continue and extend his work. It's phenomenal. To be a Christian means enjoying the privilege of continuing ministry with Jesus. You carry out his work. He is in heaven. He pours out his Holy Spirit on you so that you would continue his ministry today. That's why the last words in Matthew's gospel after Jesus has given the great commission is, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. We go out and minister in Jesus' name. So if being a disciple means being a student, a follower of Jesus, we might think of Jesus commissioning these 12 to carry out his work as an internship of sorts. These disciples are his apprentices, and he wants to bring them into his business of ministry and equip them for his work. That's what he's doing with you today. You see, the ministry of the Twelve represented an extension of the ministry of Christ. It wasn't their ministry, it was His ministry. This is not a calling of conversion, it's a calling of commission. Jesus is giving the disciples their marching orders. That's why these Twelve are often called the Apostles. The word apostle means sent one. These were the 12 sent ones. Jesus is the ultimate apostle. He was sent from the Father. And then he brings to himself 12 and he sends them as apostles to represent Jesus in this world. And so when Jesus in the Great Commission sends you, he calls you to represent him in this fallen world, to be his ambassador. And so these apostles here were seen as carrying out the work of Jesus Christ, extending his message and extending his ministry. You see, their commissioning represents a gift from Jesus to his people. If you look at the end of chapter 9, Jesus is concerned that his people, Israel, have no shepherds. They are like sheep without a shepherd. And he says, you need to pray that God would send out workers in the harvest. 
And that's what we do today when we pray for ministers, pray for elders and deacons and volunteers and missionaries. We pray that God would send out workers because there are sheep without shepherds. And then what do you get in chapter 10? Jesus answers that prayer by consecrating and commissioning these 12. The 12 represent gifts of Jesus to his church that they would have under shepherds who would carry out his ministry of care to the sheep. That's why it's so, so very important that you take care of Darren and Tyler, who are Jesus' gifts for you, that you might be equipped and cared for as the people of God. So this commissioning represents a giving of Jesus, of his servants, for the care of his people. We're told in chapter 10, verse 1, that Jesus commissions the twelve to cast out demons and heal the sick. Now, this is unique to the apostles. This was unique to the time frame of Jesus. Uh, Jesus came into the world preaching as the Messiah. How did people know that he was the long-awaited Messiah? Well, his works of miracles and his works of healing were visible validations of his verbal message. Right? His works confirmed his words. So the healing ministry of Christ was a way of validating that he was who he said he was. So healing and exorcism represented aspects of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And they validated the arrival of the kingdom over the kingdom of Satan. Jesus actually says this. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus says, If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So by the disciples extending a ministry of healing and exorcism, they are continuing the work of Christ and they're saying, you need to follow this Christ because in him the kingdom of God has come. You need to follow him. So people associated these activities of healing and exorcism with Jesus. By healing diseases and casting out demons, the public would know that these disciples belong to Jesus. We don't do acts of healing and, disciple to, and, and exorcism today. But what we do do is carry out the work that Jesus has given us in things like, say, baptism and the Lord's Supper. It's not a direct parallel. But we do the things that Jesus has told us to do because the world associates those things with Jesus. And if we're associated with him, we want to do what he has told us to do. We get our marching orders from him. The authority is found in him, and he delegates his authority to those who minister in his name. You know, dear friends, as a minister of the gospel, I have no intrinsic authority. I can't say to all of you, true Christians wear orange and blue. And if you really are going to honor God, you're going to wear orange and blue because when God created the heavens and earth, right, he created the sun, orange, and the skies blue. Therefore, if you really want to honor God, you need to wear orange and blue. I grew up in a gator family, sorry. Now, if I were to do that, I would be usurping the authority entrusted to me because I don't have the power to tell you to do that. I can only say, thus saith the Lord. It's a delegated authority. That's why the most important words of the Great Commission are not go, but Jesus saying, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, now go. Represent me in the world. So both healing and exorcism point to the establishment of God's kingdom in Jesus. The focus is not on the power and the authority of the disciples, but on their solidarity with Jesus. They do his work in this world. Friends, what does the world associate with Jesus? Well, the ultimate symbol of Christ's power is the cross of Jesus Christ, isn't it? That's why Jesus actually at the end of chapter 10 is going to say, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up a cross. So when we wield the message of Jesus, we herald the message of a cross. That is where ultimate power and authority come from. 
So here, as Christ's disciples, we're not called to heal and to exercise demons. We're called to herald the cross work of Jesus Christ. As long as Jesus gives us breath, he calls us to proclaim the ministry of the gospel. That's why what you're doing here is so important. In discipling men, women, and boys and girls, in calling down the blessings of heaven in prayer, in preaching the gospel, in worshiping with the saints, and administering the sacraments, it may not seem like much, but you're representing the work of Jesus today. You're continuing his work. He is the one who builds the church through you. And so finally and lastly, we see the identity of Christ's disciples. And here we see them outlined in verses 2 to 4. The names of the twelve are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, when you think about the identity of Christ's disciples, you have to acknowledge these represent a rather unusual lot. But what can we say about this group? Well, there are at least three things that we can say. Perhaps most importantly, we can say they are a unified group. We know more about them together than we do know about the individual disciples themselves. In the words of one commentator, the corporate role of the twelve was obviously more important and more remembered than the individual contribution of most of the members of the group. They were a unit. Friends, you represent the body of Christ. You represent more together, and you can do more together than you will ever accomplish apart in the name of Jesus. One of my favorite illustrations of this is actually in Theodore Beza's biography of Calvin. Now, John Calvin, you all know, probably most of you don't know Theodore Beza. That was his protege. And he wrote a, a little biography in honor of his mentor. And he talked about two friends that Calvin had, William Farrell, who was a firebrand, and Peter Verre, who was a warm-hearted pastor. Now, nobody talks about Farrell and Verre. They always talk about Calvin. Calvin was not a lone ranger reformer, far from it. Beza actually makes the point in saying that he believed the three of them together formed a near-perfect pastor, and they were better together than they were apart. At Emmanuel, you are better together than you are apart. You need each other to carry out the work that Jesus has given you. You can't do it alone. They are a united group. Secondly, here, they are a diverse group. Just look at these names here, and you have them in two by two. I wonder here if, if this represents that the two by two, some of the, the commissioning of Jesus here is seen maybe in the grouping of these disciples. Peter is always listed first in listings of the twelve. Perhaps this is because he's understood to be the, the leader of the group, a first among equals. But what's interesting about Peter is that he is known more for his failures than his leadership. We know very little about his brother Andrew, other than Andrew is always shown bringing people to Jesus, including his brother Peter. That episode is recorded in John chapter 1. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be known for? Andrew's not known for any great word for any great accomplishment. He's known for taking people by the hand and bringing them into the presence of Jesus. It's a pretty awesome legacy. James and John, like Peter and Andrew, were also fishermen. James will later be martyred by King Herod in Acts chapter 12, and John will go on to write five books of the New Testament. He's kind of a big deal. Philip bears a Greek name, a name that means lover of horses. I realize in Central Florida there may be some of you who are a lover of horses. Bartholomew is an Aramaic name. 
It simply means son of Tolmai. Don't really, there are people that speculate about what that means, but we don't really know. Thomas is, well, doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas for questioning the identity of Jesus after the resurrection. Matthew, as we've already seen, is known for his less than honorable career as a tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, well, let's be honest, little is really known about them. It's a reminder that history is the result, not of the famous, but the faithful. Most of history happens and unfolds as the result of the faithful work of forgotten people. Incredible. But their names are listed here. And then you have Simon the Zealot. He's marked by extreme political views which were associated with those who wanted to overthrow Rome, take matter in their own hands. And Judas, well, he is forever memorialized as the one who betrayed Jesus. He was a traitor. It's a diverse group. There's no perfect disciple. There's no platonic form that governs the ideal disciple. That's why this church opens her door to anyone and everyone in this community. There's no perfect churchgoer. No, you open your arms to all and any who come to Jesus Christ. This group is a united group. It's a diverse group. Thirdly, it's an ordinary group. Very ordinary. Four of them were fishermen. One was a tax collector. One was a political extremist. And one was a traitor. Other than that, we know little about these individuals. No CEOs, no presidents, no real politicians, nobody roaming the halls of power, no academics, no PhDs. Ordinary followers of Jesus Christ. Certainly in the words of Calvin, these disciples were men of obscurity and of no repute. They were ordinary disciples. And oh friends, that gives us great hope, does it not? God is not calling us to be extraordinary. He's calling us to be faithful. The one thing that tied these ordinary individuals together was their relationship with Jesus Christ. And if there's any application, it's certainly there for us today. No matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what class you're in, no matter what your economic status is, no matter what your education is, no matter what the color of your skin is, no matter who you are, there is a place for you in Christ's kingdom. Your dignity is found in your relationship with Jesus Christ, and Christ calls you to serve him, no matter who you are. There are no little people in the kingdom of God, as Francis Schaeffer would say. No little people, no little place, no little job. There is significance for you in this church, in this body. There is ministry for you to do. God has given you gifts for the building up of the body of Christ, you have a contribution to serve. It could be simply holding a door open on a Sunday morning, smiling. God has given some of you wonderful smiles. Some of you need a little help, all right? But I can remember my uh, wife's grandparents who are no longer living for decades. They were just greeters. And then they would meet visitors, and then they would have them in their home and show them hospitality. So maybe God has just given you a gift of smiling, of welcoming, and you can use that for the glory of God here. One of my favorite examples of this, and I'll close with this story, is the example of Mary King. You probably don't know Mary King. Again, it's another reminder that God uses the forgotten but faithful saints to bless and build his people. Mary King was a cook. 
She didn't come from wealth. She didn't have a degree from a prestigious institution. Mary King was a cook. She worked at the New Market Academy in Cambridge, in Cambridge in England. We would call her today the lunch lady. Right? You, you can think of the hairnet. I, I had a lunch lady in my high school growing up. Well, what ma makes Mary King great was that she fed her students more than grub. And among her students was one petulant Victorian young man named Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Spurgeon would say that he would learn his Calvinism from this cook, from this godly woman. Spurgeon says this, she was a good old soul and liked something very sweet indeed, good, strong, Calvinistic doctrine. Many a time we have gone over the covenant of grace together and talked of the personal election of the saints, their union to Christ, their final perseverance, and what vital godliness meant. And I do believe I learned more from her than I should have learned from any six doctors of divinity of the sort we have nowadays. Over the course of his life, Spurgeon would preach to more than 10 million people. The collection of his sermons is equivalent to 27 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And he learned his, his theology not from a seminary or a professor, but from a godly woman, his cook. It's awesome, isn't it? There are no little people, no little places. that God calls you to be faithful using the gifts that he has given you to build up others in the name of Jesus Christ. So whether you're an elder, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a youth worker, a VBS volunteer, a Bible study teacher, you work in the nursery, you help shut-ins, friends, you have an awesome responsibility of pointing others to Jesus Christ, of being a disciple, of carrying out his work. You see, God chooses people who seem to be insignificant in order to carry out the work of gospel ministry today. And so we might say a disciple is an ordinary person who points other ordinary people to an extraordinary Savior. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the ministry of this church. And so would you bless each and every man, woman, and child here today. Give them the gift of faith and build them up as they seek to be faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now in response to the preaching of God's word, you may turn in your bulletins to page 13, and we will stand and sing to God's praise, Christ be in my waking.
something today that spurred your heart. The Lord brought you here for a reason. If you have any questions, um, love to talk to you. I'll be in the breezeway. Or the person next to you would love to give you a reason for their hope in Christ. Dr. Kudel, if you can give us a benediction, please. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.